Good morning, and welcome to Christ Community Chapel Aurora Campus's online worship service. My name is Aaron Arnold. I'm the worship director here. We are so grateful that you've decided to join us today. As we begin our time together, would you join us in singing All Creatures of Our God and King? It's so good to be able to sing together. Listen to these words from Psalm 18. 
I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. What a great reminder that the God we serve, the God we just sang to, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, hears us when we cry out to him. He has not forgotten us. Let that be a great encouragement to you this morning. I'd like to take a moment now and update you on some things happening here in the life of our church. First, through the month of October, we are praying scripture over our communities. Also, Carla Merkel has organized prayer hikes every Wednesday and every other Saturday. That's a great opportunity for you to enjoy the beauty of God's nature through this fall season and spend some time in prayer. Be on the lookout on our social media for more information about that. Also, we are navigating how to handle in-person baptisms, and we are looking forward to doing that in the month of November. If you or someone you know is interested in being baptized, please let us know. We'd love to get you connected with that. Finally, we are very excited to let you know we are on schedule to start streaming our services live. What does that mean? Well, these virtual services will cease. We'll stop pre-recording and you have the opportunity to join with the rest of your church at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings, right here. It would be so great to have you join us. We miss being with you, and we know there are so many constraints on you gathering with us in person right now. So we want to make sure that you're taking full advantage of that and joining with the body of Christ as we work to remain united in this time. Now we have the opportunity to worship through our giving. If you're new here with us, please don't feel any pressure to give whatsoever. We want you to come to know and trust this ministry before you give here. But if you wouldn't mind, take a moment and text the word AURORA to 474747. That will take you to our online virtual connect card. Fill that out and it'll give us the opportunity to reach out this week and welcome you. We would love to do that. For those of us who call this place home, let's give and give generously out of what God has entrusted to us. Now, would you join me as I pray over our offering and over the sermon as Pastor Mark continues our series in the book of Acts. Father God, thank you so much for this time, for the day that you have given us the opportunity to worship you for all that you have entrusted to us. Lord, we give back to you in a heart of worship, thankful and grateful for your provision. We ask that you would use our gifts however you see fit to spread your gospel, to strengthen your kingdom on this earth. Use us for your glory in whatever capacity, in any way you see fit. Speak to us through what you have given Pastor Mark. Speak to us through the book of Acts. Help us see what you are calling us to do and give us the courage to do it. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. It's in your most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Hey, Aurora Campus family. It's Pastor Mark Lyle. Welcome. Good morning. It is great to have you with us. Um, This virtual experience has been a great gift to many of you and to me, because I know for those I don't get to see, uh, you are still connected to the church. As you heard in the announcements from Aaron, I'm really excited about what's coming because uh, we get to have this time right here, but pretty soon we're going to be able to bring you 
virtually right back into the gathering with all of us. And that is going to be a great time. Um, I'm excited. We're in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is phenomenal. Um, as I remind you, I'm going to try to remind you every week, I'm going to do chunks. You need to be reading through the entire book. In fact, I got sad this week because I realized we, can only, we only have time before Advent comes to do eight weeks of Acts. And uh, there are a lot more things we could cover. So I'm going to need you to read through them and be amazed and marvel at what God did in the early church and what he will continue to do in us. We are in Acts chapter 1 today. And uh, I want to read as I often do. And uh, we'll see together what God has for us. I'm going to pick up in verse 6, which is uh, part of where we were last week. Listen to what God's word says. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Thanks be to God for his word. Um, so last week we talked about, and I want to take a minute to remind you, the, the, the theme verse of the book of Acts, of the praxis apostolon, the the book of the work of the apostles, um, is in 8 of chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, what I want to do this week is, uh, as in, in future weeks, as I've said, we will look at the work of the Holy Spirit. But today, I want to take just a minute and, and look at the, you will be my witnesses. And I want to, I hopefully want to do it a little different, maybe a little differently than you might be expecting. Maybe you're just expecting a sermon that says, hey y'all, remember, you have to be witnessing to your friends and family as awkward and as difficult and as painful as it is. Um, no, I want to, I want to pull back for a minute and I want to say, Let's talk about witness. Let's, let's put it into a courtroom for a minute, okay? Let's, 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 let's put Jesus on trial. And let's go ahead and make you or me, in this case, it'll be me today, I'm going to be the example of the witness. Because essentially, Jesus, when he told his apostles, you're going to be my witnesses, he said, I'm not going to be my own witness. Now, you all are going to be witnesses for me. Okay? So, in order to set this up, I need to remind you one other thing. Oftentimes, you will hear me say, many times this is around when we're doing communion, you will hear me specifically refer to the importance of the, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And I specifically do that because all of those are very, very important. They're not just important historically. They're not just important theologically. They're important practically to you. But I have to ask your forgiveness because as your pastor, oftentimes I have left one out. And today's passage is the exact reminder that I don't say life, death, burial, resurrection, 
ascension. Many times it's because it just seems weird. <laughs> you have Jesus um, demonstrating the power of his resurrection by appearing. You have accounts of his disciples saying he was with us for a while and then he disappeared, but then he came back again. But here in Acts, at the very beginning of the book, at the very beginning of the establishment of the church, one of the very first acts that happens is Jesus ascends. All right, so back to our courtroom. I get dragged forward, I get sworn in. Pastor Mark, are you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth? Oh, wait a minute, I have my Bible here, I can even. Do I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God? Absolutely. All right, Pastor Mark, we have some questions for you. We understand that you are a follower of this man named Jesus. Is that true? Yes, sir, that is true. I am trying to live my life in obedience to the one that I call Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Sir, will you tell us about the life of this Savior you claim? Uh, yes, I believe, in fact, that as his witness, he was a real man who walked the earth, flesh and blood, with emotions, with pain, with joy, with contentment. I believe he ate like you and I did. I believe he was bruised like you and I are. But the difference comes in the quality of, of his life and the spiritual aspect of his life. You see, his life didn't seem to be plagued by this thing that plagues me called sin. It's almost this spiritual gravity that, that weighs me down, that even in my mind at times when I know there is a right thing to do, it's almost as if I get magnetically pulled to the desire to do a wrong thing or a rebellious thing or a thing that misses the mark. And from what I can understand of his life, not only was he not magnetically pulled to those things, he found incredible joy in the obedience he had to God his Father. It's as if it energized him. And not only that, but in the course of his life, he worked and did actions that were supernatural, that went beyond the everyday occurrence of life. In fact, he reversed the death process. He reversed the, the, the physical injury process. He fixed people physically who were broken. And he, in, he went beyond that and had, he took on people's uh, burdens. He, he, it seems like somehow in this Jesus's life, in the life of my Lord, it seems like people walked away from being with him and many of them had a desire to begin to be obedient simply because of their interaction with him. He was extraordinary, and he lived an extraordinary life. Okay, sir, um, we understand his life met a tragic end. Yes, sir, I'm sad to say it did meet a tragic end. But you, Pastor Mark, claim that that death is way beyond just sad, despairing, and tragic. You claim that death actually means something. Yes, sir, I do. I bear witness to the fact that that death was the only thing that could cosmically break the power of the magnetic pull of sin on all mankind. You claim that that Savior that you follow was then buried. Why is that an important detail? Here's why that's an important detail. 
because there are many who would want to believe that his death was fake or that he was mortally wounded or that he wasn't really human and that his godness escaped at that moment. But we are told, and I bear witness to the fact that he died and was placed in the ground as we do with our loved ones. His life breath was taken from him. And finally, sir, you claim that it did not end there. Yes, sir, you are correct. The reason that I do what I do, the reason I am who I am, the reason any of us who get to call ourselves Christ followers can do so is because our Lord was raised in power by his Father, never to be affected by physical death again. And sir, why is that important? The reason that is important is because it gives life and hope to all creatures like me who someday will have to face the sting of death. He has broken for all time the power of death and he reigns supreme because of that. While these are big claims for you and I to believe, as I said, there's another one in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, and that would be, okay, sir, you claim that this Jesus that you serve is alive, no longer to be affected by death. So where is he? Well, sir, that's a great question. Because for 40 days, he proved himself to those who had followed him and many, many more. He showed and he had them physically touch and he ate with. And then after instructing his closest friends and disciples, he ascended into heaven. Pastor Mark, isn't that rather convenient that the Savior who has been resurrected was, take, was swept from the earth to be assumed into the heavens? That seems quite difficult to believe. Yes, sir, I agree with you. That is quite puzzling and hard to believe. But I know this for a fact that there are those who could have saved their lives by recanting this. And they went to their deaths saying, I can't say any different because I was with him and I saw him ascended into the heavens. And just like that, we bear witness to the gospel. Now, this is, of course, allegorical. This is me playing courtroom for a few minutes. But friends, you and I, our lives give us the opportunity to bear witness to those in our lives, our friends, our family, our, our workmates, who are part of the culture of Jesus on trial, who are part of the cynicism of life can't include the divine. There's no way that God reached out to us and became like us. But here's what I've left out, is the ascension. And, and while I believe that Jesus is not with us because he ascended, the question I failed to ask myself, and, and I, I hope it's a pertinent one for you is, why? Why did he ascend? What's the purpose in that? And I, 
I said these things would be practical, right? I said they're not only historical, they're not only theological, but they're practical. And you heard them. I went through them. Jesus' life is practical to you because he, by his perfect life, he qualified for the life we were called to live. By his death, he sacrificed so that he could open the gateway that in spite of the fact that you and I had failed in the life we should have lived, he opened the gateway to forgiveness, legal spiritual justice, taking the penalty on him that had was supposed to be directed onto us. His burial identified him with us. The reality of being ultimately raised out of the grave from death so that we can have the hope that when we face the same end, we can face the same victory. And ultimately, his resurrection, of course, is the power of new life. It is the power of regenerated, recreated, redeemed life so that God can draw all of us to the life we were supposed to be living. And then Jesus ascends. Why? And there's a wonderful, wonderful quote from an article that Tim Keller uh, contributed on. And, and by the way, if, you, if you'd like, I'd be happy to send you the link. Send me, simply send me an email request and I would love to send you the link to this entire article. But listen to how Keller summarizes why Jesus ascended. He says, Jesus leaves the space-time continuum and he passes into the presence of the Father. He is still human, still our second Adam, and still our advocate. Yet now he has been so glorified that everything he does has a cosmic scope. Any time-space limitation passes away. That's awesome. That reminds us that while Jesus was here, feet on the dust of the earth, he, and we know this, Paul tells us this too, he was limited in who he could interact with, who he could love, what he could do. But when he ascended to heaven, everything that he had been able to do locally with his, with his community, with those he loved, he now has the capacity to do for the entire world. He can be, as Keller said, he can be advocate. That's the one, and not just for me, for me and you and people in China. He can be the one who loves us intimately. And when we sin, instead of him being here, he is at the right hand of the Father saying, paid for, paid for, paid for. He is our high priest. He has made sacrifice and sat down at the right hand of the Father because, and think of the joy that they experience in the completion of the work together. The work is finished. Calvin says this, John Calvin wrote in his Institutes, he says this, he says, the Lord by his ascension into heaven has opened up access to the heavenly kingdom, which Adam had shut. For having entered it in our flesh, as it were in our name, it follows that we are in a manner seated in heavenly places, not entertaining a mere hope of heaven, but possessing it in Jesus our head. He is the one who gives us hope. He is the king of all. He is the Lord of all. And he has ascended to his throne. So again, 
The life of Jesus is critical. The death, his burial, his resurrection. But our Lord is alive. He has ascended to the Father. And just like it says here, because the apostles, as they stood, they were astounded, as you would expect. They thought, what just happened? Is this another temporary disappearance? No, he has been exalted. He has been glorified. It's why we worship him. But keep in mind the words of those, those who stood with the apostles, the angels who stood there. They said this, why do you stand here? And that, that's not just questioning, are you a bunch of goofs? It's saying, you have work to do. Your Savior is exalted. He is the magnificent ruler on high. Get busy with his work. Get busy as his witness. And know that he has not left you forever. You will feel this separation. He is coming back. Don't live your lives like he has gone forever. He will return. I hope that is true of every one of us, that we can live our lives in such a way that we can say, we are about the work of our ascended Lord. We are about the work of his kingdom. And we are driven by the hope that he will either come again in the same way he left and draw me to him, or he will hit the power of his Holy Spirit will resurrect me and take me to him. Thanks be to God for the death, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of his son. Pray with me, would you please? Father God, we have again found your glory inside your word. It resonates with our hearts and with our souls. It reminds us that we are not alone, that you have not, not only have you not abandoned us, but you are actively loving us by the care of our great high priest and by the work and the comfort of your spirit that is unleashed as a result of Jesus' ascension. And we are thankful. Thankful to be your people. Thankful to be your church. May we glorify you in your church. In Christ's name, amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my life Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that. Yes.
stake and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well.
It's been great to worship with you this morning. My hope and prayer is that this service has been a tremendous encouragement to you. No matter what this week holds, remember that we can truly say it is well because Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the King. He is in control and he is not surprised by anything. Let me send you out with a benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go and have a great week in Christ.